We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, and that's still not Emily. Adam, you're still here on the podcast. I'm still here on the podcast. You just can't get rid of me. No, hasn't, has, haven't been able to yet, um, even if we are full states away from each other. True, true, true. Yeah. This, this was pretty wild. This was a good one. Uh, it, there have been good moments in the last couple races, but it's been a while since there has been a race where it just felt like the whole race was so exciting. Yeah, I mean, even like the, you know, Australia when Max had to DNF because of the the braking issue on his car, you know, because the brakes exploded. Um, it, it, you know, this was like the, I was lying in my bed watching it, like my iPad propped on my computer on my chest. And then right. the, like the impact happened. And then I just like sat right up. I'm like, I need to be sitting for this. <laughs> um, so it was, it was, it was a fun one. Yeah, it was good. It was, uh, everybody brought their A game. I think everybody, everybody felt throughout the sprint and the actual race, uh, aggressive, I think is a good that, word for it. That's like, the exact word I was um, thinking of. Nobody, nobody came into this race ready to just slide by. Everybody was going to try and win, and everybody was going to try and uh, do what they can. And it really showed. So it was definitely yeah. one of the more exciting races we've seen so far. Yeah, exactly. So before we dive in, we do have a little bit of news to discuss. And I want to start just by going on record and saying, I really don't want to talk about this first news piece, um, but because I am sick and tired of Jos Verstappen trying to stay relevant yeah. to Max's career this season. I'm really tired of him. Um, I feel like we almost get more news from Jos Verstappen than we do of Max. Yeah, yeah. And like he, so if you're living under a rock and you haven't been, you know, haven't noticed this weekend, he's upset because Christian Horner allegedly wouldn't let him participate with the rest of the Red Bull drivers that were in Austria in the Legends Parade that was happening. Um, and, you know, because he and Christian are still mad at each other, or at least he's mad at Christian for what happened at the beginning, like in preseason with the alleged text messages. Um, and Yost keeps implying that Max is going to leave Red Bull like five minutes after Max confirms he's staying at Red Bull, um, <laughs> which is just, you know, really kind of dumb. And I've said this before, I think that Max moving to Mercedes, especially still in this current regulation, would destroy his career in a way that Max is not ready to to give up. Um, and I, I, I don't want to think that Yos is as short-sighted as he is acting to do something that would damage Max's career in this way, especially with the way Max's career has gone and is currently, you know, being in this season. Right. Um, I think, too, Red Bull's just tired of him. Uh, he kind of led this whole campaign against Christian Horner and uh, shocked when Christian Horner came out on top. He's shocked that the guy he tried to get rid of won't let him participate. So I think he definitely dug his own grave on this one. Um, I'll be glad to see him less, hopefully going forward. And hopefully... Max can figure out that uh, his own career needs he needs to separate it from his dad. Yeah, and like the problem for Max is the fact that like as much as Max may or may not want to side with his team, he's always going to have to side with his dad because it's his dadager, his, his dad manager, right. and you know he you know he has been side by side with Max throughout Max's entire career. We've heard all the the stories, the gas station incident, threatening a guy with a you know a wrench, all the the funny funny stories of like ooh that's a a, a, a yas ism. Um, so you know it puts Max in a really difficult position where he you know doesn't have the absolute most fastest dominant car on the grid right now. I do think that the Red Bull has improved over the last couple of weeks since like the moments in like Imola Monaco where we're like, oh, what's happening with Red Bull? Everything's falling right. apart. But I, I think that it's, it's an, a lot of unnecessary pressure on Max. And then you have Yo saying like, the more pressure he's under, the better he drives. And I'm just like, let him live. Like let the external mm -hmm. pressures pressure him like at McLaren, not the in his own house pressures. Right. And we know 
I think you're right. I think Red Bull's kind of figuring out whatever they need to figure out. Um, but I think other teams are figuring their stuff out more. I think that they're closing the gap. Uh, but as we get closer and closer to 2026, who knows what it's, what any of this is going to look like. Um, also so that. I, I don't think that you can pick between the high-end teams, between those top five teams, uh, which one is going to come out on top and strongest in 2026. So I think um, the moving around to try and get a better car is less effective when you're in those top five teams uh, coming into new regulations. Yeah. And I mean, like, do I want to see Max stay at Red Bull through the duration of his contract to 28? Obviously I do. Would it surprise me if Max leaves in 26 to go to another team at the start of the next regulation? No, it probably wouldn't. But to send Max to, say, for example, Mercedes in 2025 would be absolutely (laughs) ridiculous. It would be bonkers. Yeah. And like, that's, that's not what we want to see. And that's not what Max you know, should have for his career. Um, it's right. just, you know, Yost leads, needs to just go to wherever Yost is when he's not at races. He needs to go back to rallying or whatever he, he does when he's not driving us crazy at yeah. Max's races. He needs to retire. Be done. I mean, he doesn't have to. I mean, you look at him, you look at Carlos Sainz Sr. Like, they're still <laughs> racing. They're still yeah. they're still doing it in the, in the senior categories. But just... Well, I need to retire from the Formula One scene from all of the... Yeah. yeah, I'm like I'm like developing a list of former Formula One drivers who I don't want to hear of in the media. Jos Verstappen, Rolf Schumacher, Jock Villeneuve. Like the the list just keeps growing this season. I'm just right. like, okay, how how much bigger enough is this is list going to get? Yeah, um, and enough is enough about talking about this. Let's talk about Yuki for a second um, oh, because. Yuki. This this was this was a little bit of an oh Yuki moment where he was fined forty thousand euros for using um, discriminatory language on the radio. I'm not going to say bad language on the radio, which is what I have in our rundown because he uses mm. bad words pretty often, and that's what yeah. he's known for. But he used a discriminatory word um, that you know he sa- has since wholeheartedly apologized for. Um, but the the point is is that the word that he used is um, a word that you know. I heard very commonly growing up as a '90s kid. Um, I'm assuming you also, because you're you're a little all bit younger time. than I am, but you yeah. also heard it all the time. Um, but then the point we have to remember is that Yuki learned English when he was 18 years old from car mechanics who aren't as say woke right. as as people are now. Right. It's uh, yeah. I I. I don't necessarily disagree with the FIA in stepping in and saying sure. um, we're not going to allow this language but I think that they definitely strung him up a little bit as an example uh, I, I don't know if there's much else to say about that I think that it's unfortunate for him I mean huge fine I certainly don't think he intended it in a discriminatory way no no uh, ab- absolutely not um, but, but I can't blame the FIA for wanting to for taking it seriously no no absolutely and they they've basically they've said that they've reserved half of the amount of the fine um so twenty thousand euros that the team will get back if he you know doesn't have another incident of using that language which don't think he will because you know and and i i think that you know i don't want to say that people are being overly sensitive about it um because obviously it is not a word that we use anymore in in polite society and i say polite society in quotes um but it's you know it was an incident it's obviously not what he thinks i thought that the statement he put out was appropriate um and you know i don't think there needs to be any more of this you know as we move on from this weekend right um I, I think this was a one-time incident. I think that um, it was addressed, and I don't see this coming back. I don't either. Anyway, so. let's move on from that, as as we will move on from this, and talk about Ollie Behrman, our favorite super sub um, right. from earlier this season. Um, he may not be lighting up the leaderboard in F2, but he is. Uh, he did win the sprint race this weekend in Austria. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's, in, he's going in the right direction. Right. Um, We'll see. I uh, I think that he has a lot of potential. 
yeah, it's it's been really interesting. Like, I, I don't know how much you've been following F2, I'm going to assume, not nearly as much as I have. Not nearly as much as you have. Um, but, you know, I, I took a look at the leaderboard. I, I didn't see what happened to him in the feature race, but I don't think, I either don't think he drove in it or he did not start. I'm not sure what happened to Behrman in the feature race, but, like, Ollie's not, like, lighting up the leaderboard. He's not very high up in the standings. But to that end, neither is Kimi Antonelli. Um, so right. it's it's very interesting to think about the drivers that are being highlighted in F2 for F1 seats compared to the drivers that are leading the standings in F2. Because they're completely, totally different subsets of people. Um, and so it, it also goes back to the question of, is F2 appropriately preparing drivers for F1? Um, which I do think the answer is still no. Yeah. Uh, what do you think they could be, what do you think is wrong with the F2 to F1 progression? Um, I mean, for the most part, it's really just the car. The the mm -hmm. the car that they use is still, you know, it's it's a spec car. They it's you know not the to the same caliber as these F one cars, but you know earlier on in the existence of F2, it was a little bit more of a step down where now it's kind of like a giant leap down from F1 right. to F2. And so they need to find a way for F2 to be able to minimize that gap and not just create another feeder series in between F1 and F2, like F1 and a half. Um, they, they need to do something to improve the vehicles in F2, you know, probably, you know, put a little bit more money into F2 so that it makes it, you know, not equitable to F1, but at least, you know, getting them a little bit more experienced than just the drivers who are lucky enough to get into the rookie test sessions and that, you know, get, you know, lucky enough to test off track and off weekends, which is what Antonelli has been doing a lot of lately. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see going forward. I think that there's some room for uh, changes and developments in the lower leagues, but, but yeah. we'll see. It's just a whole bunch of questions at this point. Um, but yeah. anyway, let's talk about the sprint race because the sprint talk race the sprint actually, race. it had a really interesting start um, that I had to like look into to, to see about why it had sure. happened. Yeah, it, uh, it kind of felt, it reminded me of Baku where the FIA was just letting people in the wrong positions. And oh, getting, right. When, going when, back. when, when Akon was still pitting at the end of the race and they, they let all the, the, um, the FIA staff onto, onto the, into the pit lane. Exactly. Where we knew yeah. he was pitting. FIA knew he was pitting. The announcers knew he was pitting. But everyone um, else forgot. But everybody else forgot. Um, I'm not sure how related this is to that. But again, I, it just feels weird. They keep letting people in the wrong spots. Yeah, well, what was interesting, because I actually had to look this up, because they didn't really talk about what caused the, the aborted start. Like, they thought, mm -hmm. you know, listening to the broadcast, they thought someone stalled. Um, and then I had to, like, I follow an F1 photographer on YouTube, and he explained what had happened because he was down there. Um, but, like, at the super last, last minute, race control decided that the photographers stationed at turn one were not safe there, even though they had been there every race ever. Oh. And all weekend so far. Yeah. And so yeah. what's interesting is, is like the photographers, when they get to a track every race weekend, they get a map with like red zones of like, here are places where you cannot shoot. And mm -hmm. this area in turn one was not that place. Um, but it turns out that race control decided like, I guess at the very beginning of that first formation lap, they're like, we're not okay with this. Um, right. So they, tr they, they set marshals down to get them moved and then they didn't get them in time. So that's what caused the aborted start. It wasn't any of the cars on track, um, but they like, there was no actual explanation to it because it wasn't car related. So you like had to like find it elsewhere, which I just thought was very interesting. Right. Uh, yeah. A little more transparency would have been fun, but still a bizarre, a bizarre way to start a race. Yeah, and I, I think, like, you're right about transparency being valuable, especially considering, you know, adding another formation lap takes away a lap from the race. And sprint right. races are short enough as it is because they're only going 100 kilometers. So it's like, that would be a place where you would need that explanation, like, just like a quickie press release from race control. Like, it doesn't even have to be easy exactly. like, on the time and timing screens. Like, you know, people were in the way. Just something to appease. Uh personnel had to be moved Great. yeah exactly and i mean and of course it's like like the five people in the world who would be really curious about it which are like us nerds uh, yeah. but yeah but anyway the race itself 
was exciting for for a little bit and then it became one of those max did max things as max tends to do yeah um but you know the the fight between max and lando which turned out to be serious foreshadowing for today yeah. um but the fact that L lando was able to go from p2 to p1 all the way down to p3 in like three turns um it, it really shows you that like lando is is really going for it these days and he's he's really like he knows what it's like to win and he really wants to get back there right and i think he's in a car and in a position now where he can and i think he knows it so yeah, fully uh yeah watching him in the sprint definite foreshadowing uh but i think that more than that too it gave him a taste and it gave him that i was this close i could have done it so i need to get out tomorrow and uh do it better and i think that's part of where the aggression this morning came from yeah, so let's let's talk about that. Let's dive into the the Max versus Lando of it of it all from today because it yeah. you know we thought Max was going to cruise until that last pit stop, and then mm -hmm. it didn't. Um, and then he didn't. Yeah, it it was you know it it really you know obviously you build up leads so that if you have to accidentally have a six second pit stop, then mm -hmm. you know you it's okay. Um, but the McLaren is really fast right now. And, you know, Max had been nursing some sort of nonsense issue um, throughout the race. So it really left him very vulnerable. Right. But what it did remind me of is it, you know, the, the battle really reminded me of how he battled with Lewis Hamilton throughout all of the 2021 season. Like that was fully how Max drives when he's competing against someone else who is at his caliber. Right. It's it's fun to see Max Verstappen drive again. Uh, if you're a huge Max Verstappen fan, it's exciting to see him out in the front and winning and doing crazy things. But to really see him drive and to see what made him a world champion in the first place, uh, it's exciting to see that again. And it's exciting for the rest of the field that we have cars and drivers that are ready to challenge him for it. Oh, fully. And I will also, you know, acknowledge that if you're listening to this as a McLaren fan, you're probably <laughs> not as pleased with the way Max was driving. Um, right. But I do, I, I really feel based off what I've been reading throughout the day since, since the race ended, you know, while running around running a summer camp, is that both teams think they're right about mm -hmm. how they feel about the other driver's performance. So Red right. Bull thinks that Lando was overly aggressive and, you know, McLaren thinks Max was overly aggressive. So what was the answer? The answer is both of them were really far on the line and, you know, maybe towed that line a little too closely, um, but in a way that we really have only seen happening between teammates this season. Um, so right. I think it's a, I think it's a little bit of a surprise that we're seeing it between opponents right now. And mm -hmm. that, you know, especially especially opponents who are one two in the standings, right? You know, it's it's a little bit of a distant one two, but it's still a one two right now, and mm -hmm. this is like the one two that we expected between Max and Charles Leclerc. Um, that we'll talk about Leclerc in a minute because right, woof. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the guy who actually won the race. Let's indeed, and I just gotta say, uh, I may not have put him in first, but I did predict he was gonna have a good uh, a good weekend. Yeah, Before yeah, you know, he. you know, George really took advantage and and somebody said to to me this morning that George took advantage very similar to how Max took advantage in 2016 in Spain when Hamilton and Rosberg took each other out and all of a sudden Max was just <laughs> like, "Oh, hey, I guess I'm going to win this race now." Right. So yeah. I'm excited for him. I like him. I like selfishly I like seeing him succeed at Mercedes especially after uh with Hamilton leaving. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if you listen to the podcast regularly, you know he's not <laughs> Emily's favorite driver. But, you know, it's like I said to my dad this morning, at least it wasn't Lewis on the on the top step. Um, and I'd be interested to see uh hear some background from Mercedes cuz it felt like earlier on uh Hamilton may have let him through. Yeah, they they so... they, they 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 did do a little bit of of I don't know, maybe it was, I think it was like team orders, probably. I 
honestly, it right. was very early in the morning and I wasn't paying as much attention to, to Mercedes on the track. Um, but this does bring to another point that I talk about a lot is that Mercedes is really good at like sneakily picking up a ton of points. And this isn't mm -hmm. even sneaky about it. Like this is George got 25 full points that they right. really need to kind of claw their way back up in the constructor standings. And we'll, we'll go through, you know, what's happening with the constructors and, you know, once we're done talking about the drivers, because uh, there's, there's a lot, lot to see there. And I wonder if this is the uh, the beginning of Mercedes saying we are shifting our focus and we are moving on from Lewis Hamilton. Uh, well, I mean, we we talked the, you know, the other day about them insisting that they're not sabotaging his car. So, you know, <laughs> it's I mean, it's probably a little bit of both, but they, they do, you know, they, they brought George onto the team after putting him at Williams for a couple of years and, you know, deciding that George was going to, you know, be the guy and they're, right. you know, with the way that they're going, they're not going to replace George with a, you know, a, a, a guy like, you know, a Max or, or I mean, Toto wants Max, but like, a, you know, they're not going to bring Botas back. Um, right. Ricardo's probably not going there. Sign's probably not going there. So it, it really is, you know, it's going to be George's team now. It is. Uh, and I think that uh, at this point in the season, they know that Lewis isn't going to, I mean, you can never say never, but I'm pretty confident in saying Lewis is not going to win world driver championship. Uh, yeah. I feel like George is not either, but you can start preparing the team to prioritize George and you can start setting the team up for his style of driving and to make him as uh, good of a racer as, as you can. And I right. think we're slowly starting to see that shift in Mercedes of them saying, well, Lewis is still here, but we're going to start prioritizing uh, the driver that's staying with us, the one that's going to stay here. So, Right, which is something that typically does happen, you know, closer to, you know, the summer break. And obviously we're in the middle of summer right now where, you know, outgoing drivers are going to start being, you know, not, you know, excluded from certain, you know, high level meetings, especially when we're thinking about, you know, the, the end of this year's car, the beginning of next year's car. So Lewis right. at Mercedes, Nico Hulkenberg at Haas, um, Esmond Ocon at, at Alpine, you know, these are all drivers who are, are definitely, you know, we're going to see them favored a little bit less car, um, Carlos at, at Ferrari um, than, than their teammates though, you know, mm -hmm. Carlos at Ferrari has always been favored less than his team teammate um and right. we'll talk about him in, in a and second yet. but and yet um but and we'll get we'll get there but for now yeah but for now george had you know george nobody saw george coming he got the win um and oscar after having a, a a couple of weeks where i feel that he wasn't performing to the caliber that we know that that oscar can perform oscar mm -hmm. came away with a pair of p2s this weekend yeah um he looked strong um, I think that a little bit more power into that McLaren and he and Lando, we're going to see the two of them going at it a lot more for, for some big points. Yeah. There, those two are, are, are definitely, you know, on, on the, the rail to, to, to start fighting each other as well. Um, right. and he also managed to do this while overcoming damage from that impact with Leclerc on lap one. Yeah. So, you know, he, he really managed to, to make something really good out of what could have been, you know, really bad or really mediocre, um, which mm -hmm. is honestly, you know, we haven't really seen what we've expected out of Oscar. Um, so this, this was, right. this was really great to see. I, I, I'm very happy for it. Yeah. Um, he's a great driver and I think he's really starting to show it. And so, yeah, it'll be exciting. I mean, he, he easily could have won a couple weeks ago instead of Lando. Um, Fully. I think that that was as great as Lando did part, just the situation of what happened uh, with the race and the timings and the pit stops and uh, Lando won out in that one, but Oscar was really showing us that he could have been the one to take over uh, and he could have been the one to finish it. And so I think he needs just a little bit more polish um, and consistency throughout the race. And once he gets that, he's going to be another top driver and top force to be reckoned with. Yeah, and, and to, to make a point that I know Emily would make if she were on, Oscar's only in his second season in Formula One. And right. he's like, this is this is huge for a guy in his second season in Formula One. So this is, you know, and, and we knew he was going to be talented. We knew that, you know, in, in silly season 22, when we had all the drama with him leaving Alpine for, for McLaren, we knew that there was a reason for that. And we're seeing that reason in reality now. 
Right. I won't be surprised in five years when we're talking, when you have me as a guest on the podcast again, and we're talking about um, Oscar Piastri's World champion dominance. Oscar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so. And then other other guys that will hopefully continue to be dominant, even though we don't know where they're driving yet. Carlos Sainz <laughs> is back on the podium for the first time since Monaco. Carlos and his Sainz fifth podium is back this season. on the podium. Yeah. yeah. I... Uh... I've said it, I know I've said it to you before, but I think that, I think that Ferrari made the wrong choice with their driver. Yeah. With who they're I keeping agree. and who they're putting their, who they're putting their cards with. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. I think that we just got to wait and see where he's going. Yeah, exactly. And I did hear today after the race that like the door is closing on, you know, him going to Williams, um, which I think was like kind of the the presumed front runner. So I do think mm -hmm. that's interesting. I know that Williams really wants to lock up that second seat very quickly and Carlos is taking yeah. his sweet time. So that could mean that he's, you know, heavily considering the Alpine offer, which I think would be not great um or the the sauber offer or an offer we don't know about yet um right. but i just i am still impatient and just still want to know but i think that you know getting carlos back onto the podium um because he, he either has like a really you know podium caliber race or a really anonymous race this season and i feel like there's really no in between right and i'm glad he's still not you know outwardly fighting charles about what happened in spain last week yeah it's nice to see the two of them at least uh roughly social with each other yeah exactly i mean and le like we said like we said when we were talking about you know max and lando and the relationship between carlos and, and charles is not even to this like the personal relationship between them i don't think is the same as the relationship between those two and they're moving right. forward like they're we're all adults here allegedly yeah. allegedly yeah um and then speaking of the american team um they had double points uh, for the first time since Australia this year. And I looked at it and this is just the second time since Austria 2022. So two years ago that they've had a double points weekend. So that's, that's really good for Haas. That's incredible for them. It's, it's good to see. Uh, it's always fun to see a team fighting at the bottom to not just have one really good race, but to have two racers both have really good races or two drivers both have really good races in a weekend so very happy yeah. for them yeah even if nico hulkenberg was the guy who picked up the two penalty points for fighting alonzo instead of kevin magnuson picking up his last two penalty points I so know you, you almost got that you you did yeah. cat, catch the team just not the driver <laughs> I'm starting to think at this point, too, uh, the FI is not going to give Magnuson those last two unless it's something really egregious. I think they <laughs> have shown they like to dish them out early on, and then as they get closer and closer to that penalty mark, they go, well... What? Let's, let's, let's not be so hasty here. Exactly. What would the reality of banning a driver for a race actually look like? Um, right. So, yeah, I, I you know, we, we talk about it and we talk about how close Magnuson is. We talked about how close Gas. Well, we didn't talk about it on the podcast because we weren't podcasting at the time. But Emily and I personally talked about, you know, how close Gasly was and how we didn't believe it would ever happen. And now Gasly's like those points have been, you know, coming off of his license. So it's like it's probably not. But it's fun to talk about right yeah so and then we'll see what happens. Other, yeah we'll see and then other things to that are fun to talk about is danny ricardo actually had a good not full weekend but he had a good grand prix weekend which is really kind of what matters right. more so you know i don't think there's a lot of hope for him you know keeping his seat at v carb I but i like seeing little, him do well little. exactly yeah, it's always nice seeing him do well i mean he's kind of a he's such a personality in f1 so it's nice yeah, to see him do well, but it's not going to be enough, I don't think. I don't, I don't think so either, and I think that they really need to get Lawson in the car because I don't think Red Bull as yeah. a family can afford to lose Liam Lawson because I can see Lawson get to Red Bull when Perez decides to retire in a couple of years probably. Um, mm -hmm. But I did, I did really like that after having a very mm -hmm. mediocre sprint, um, the V-Carb, they did a lot of setup changes after after the sprint race when the car went out of Park Ferme, which I also appreciate with the new Park Ferme rules for sprint weekends um, that they were able to do so you know they made some massive changes and it led daniel to getting p9 today and so he yeah. you know the second you know second race of the season in the points which is exactly what we want to see out of a this the junior um, red bull team and b just out of daniel you know being a really good driver 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then to go into who else disappointed, there's really only one highlight for, for uh, disappointment in I feel this weekend, and it's Charles Leclerc. It is Charles Leclerc. He, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a disappointing, a disappointing start. Uh, and I'd have to go watch that collision a little bit more closely later. Um, yeah. But I don't know if it was really his fault. I don't, I don't think so. I think that's, you know, I think you categorize that as an opening lap racing incident, which is, exactly. you know, exactly what they did with, with, you know, Magnuson's crash in Monaco. And obviously it's just, it's very unfortunate that Leclerc, you know, Leclerc broke the Monaco curse, but now he has the curse of like the upgrades not working out, you know, engine failure, collisions, um, you know, having, you know, three pit stops before the, right. you know, midpoint of the race. So it, it was just, it's been a really tough time for Ferrari and for Leclerc. And it's, it's really nobody, nobody really expected this, especially when the storylines after Monaco were like Max V. Charles again, part 85. But right. no, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. So. so. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but to talk about the standings real quick, because I, I feel like we forget to actually talk about the drivers and constructors standings on this podcast. Um, but I feel like it's a little important to right now. Um, yeah. There have been seven drivers so far this season who have cracked a hundred points. Um, and those are Max, obviously Lando, who is in P2. Max is up by 81 points. Um, mm -hmm. Lando and Leclerc are still very close. There's only six points between them in P2 and P3. Um, and then Carlos Sainz and Sergio Perez are rounding out the top five obviously red bull would like to see Perez a little further up but i just don't know right. how that's gonna happen and then oscar and george round out the you know the top seven who've broken 100 um i feel like we are we're seeing a much larger distribution of points than we have the last couple seasons Fully. so it's very nice to see uh more competition to see yeah. well we still tend to see the same one or two in first and second uh, it's nice to see the rest of the field kind of getting shuffled. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's, you know, it's not something that we talk about often, but the, the like the drivers have incentives for finishing as high up the grid, right. you know, the grid as possible at the end of the season. So, you know, the likes of Joe, Botas and Sargent who have yet to score 11 races in, that's pretty rough on them, especially when you're behind someone like Ollie Behrman, who has raced once in Formula One and is still P14 in a 20 driver championship. Yeah. Of which Sergeant is twenty first. Yeah, uh, that's going to be a tough stat. Um, that's going to look really bad. Yeah. Uh, especially, especially if Kick Sauber, whatever their name is, continues <laughs> to ends this season. I, I don't know. Is if we? Ever it's not. Had it's a not team? common. It's it's not common. But I, I it's happened. I think Haas did it. Last, not not last year. I think it happened for Haas a couple years ago. It's it's okay. it's not good. Um, it's not a good look. Yeah, I mean, it's what we thought was going to happen to Alpine, but then you know, Alpine ha had double points last week. One of them, Gasly, finished in the points this week. Alpine being up this high on the grid just just, it just feels weird to us. Yeah. Um, and seeing them battle each other for those spots is oh yeah, yeah entertaining. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you you bring that up, and and one of the the moments that was like one of the few dramatic moments of the midpoint of the race today was, of course, when Akon and Gasly were fighting each other again. Um, and right. Ted Kravitz said, um, "Oh, what is is Bruno Famine gonna do? Sack Akon again?" <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. So. It's always something with them. It'll it'll be interesting to see where if Akon gets a seat based on you know his reputation, which yeah. earned or unearned is is you know it is what it is. Yeah, it's there. Yeah. So, and then to quickly wrap up the constructors before we break down our attempt at predicting things, which let me tell <laughs> you went bad. Um, constructors, um, Red Bull still has a pretty solid lead over Ferrari. They're 64 points up. There's only 23 points between Ferrari and McLaren. So between Lando and Charles um, as, you know, the driver two, three fight. And then this, you know, fight between Ferrari yeah. and McLaren. And I predicted going into the season that McLaren could, you know, hop up over Ferrari. And right. I look a little less ridiculous at this time of year. <laughs> so just saying. Fair. Credit where credit is due. 
Yes, and I will take that credit. Um, and then McLaren is has a hefty lead over Mercedes, and of course, McLaren being a Mercedes customer team, it's a little silly. And then you've got Aston Martin, who is a very distant fifth behind these top four. Right. So the battle for the top four throughout the the latter half of the season is going to be really interesting from a constructor standpoint. And then you know who's going to get the wind tunnel time, you know who's going to get more and who's going to get less based on where the teams finish and prize money allocations, all that other fun stuff. Exactly. Um, it'll be interesting to see. I think that if the season continues the way it is, McLaren's going to catch up. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see them finish second. Or, uh, with the way that things have been going, I wouldn't be surprised to see them completely overtake for, uh, Red Bull. I mean, with the way Perez has been driving, there's mm-hmm. definitely a chance because... Max is only one driver. McLaren exactly. has Oscar and Lando. Um, and if, so that could be a shock, you know, constructors challenge. Yeah. We'll see. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. There's still time, but uh, there's also still a lot of time for a lot of things to, to go down, you know, on, on both sides. But yeah. Perez needs to figure his life out and, you know, whatever he needs to do to be the, the number two driver at Red Bull, he needs to start being that guy again as a as a Red Bull fan. I'm just saying. Agreed. Yeah. So our predictions. Oof, this is rough. We we went um we we went one for and we had we, I think we were one for six uh, collectively because so. um, we totally blew sprint pole um the yeah. the one time that we go against Max Max gets pole um, because Emily and I picked Lando and you picked Oscar and yeah. Max did Max things Max did Max things yeah and then the I was actually really close on the sprint podium and. You were also very close on the sprint I was podium. Also very close the you sprint got podium. one and two correct, um, and just missed um, P three because you had George over Lando, which you also said <laughs> might have you. You almost got that, and I had you got not that. backtracked yourself. Yeah. Oops. Uh, yeah, I just got to switch those two. Yeah, hindsight. What what a, what a friend. But I had Max Lando Oscar, so I just flipped the McLarens. And then Emily had Lewis Hamilton in the mix, which did not happen. He was a little bit further down. And then P eight. None mistakes. of us expected exactly. None of us expected Perez to be the one to to finish P eight no. when we had me picking George, uh, you picking Fernando, and Emily picking Oscar, who definitely did not finish. Definitely near was P8. not. Yeah. No. But we did get Grand Prix poll correct. There was a clean sweep for Shocker. Max. Max. <laughs> so um, Emily and I each get an extra point. Um, so I believe it's now 21 to 14, I think, is, is where our standings are. I'll have to actually do that math and update the spreadsheet. Um, but we totally blew the podium because nobody predicted that podium because uh, it no. was George, Oscar, and Carlos. And I picked Max Lando, Carlos. You picked Max Lando and Oscar. And Emily picked Max Lando and Lewis. Yeah. Uh, what a shock. Oops. Yep. No one had that on our bingo card. <laughs> um, and then P10 was Esteban Akon. Emily and I picked uh, the Aston Martins who have just looked terrible lately. And you mm-hmm. picked Perez, which was actually could have been a, a reasonable pick. But I think he, he the, right. Perez got beat by Nico Hulkenberg. So after the fact, I am going to advance Sergio Perez into who disappointed as you know with Charles Leclerc, um, because there is no way in in any universe where Sergio Perez should be overtaken on the last lap by Nico Hulkenberg in those cars right. that they're driving. Yeah. Oops. Sorry, I just wanted to. You'll you'll have to excuse me for a second. I wanted to see something. Hmm. Because I was. Terribly curious. Um, I was I was curious where Perez would have ended if, uh, I, for some reason it just I blanked that Verstappen did finish the race. Uh, uh-huh. Only Norris retired, so that would have put him at P eight. Yeah, again. yeah. He, you, you, you. I, was, I see where you were. I see where you were going. I was with looking this. to see if that would have, if I could have just pulled that out to try and redeem myself a bit, but I can't. I mean, it's it's still not where he's expected it's to fair. be, from, you know, where, wherever no. he was. And then, big surprise, you got close. Um, I got you close. Picked, you, you picked that Yuki would be in the points. Um, it was his teammate. Um, yeah. And then I picked that Alex Albon was going to have a strong weekend, which he fully did not. 
fully nowhere. Nope. <laughs> um, but I am also going to give myself credit for who's going to do a dumb because I did pick Ferrari. And Charles Leclerc had three pit stops before the midpoint of the race. And yeah. no matter the fact that obviously he had a puncture and had to pit, you know, ve- you know, on the first lap, Very early, but yeah. I'm, I'm giving myself the credit for that because that was a little, it, I think you the strategy is still a little ridiculous, especially when yeah. they come on the radio and say, you're predicted to finish in the points when he was at like P 18 and you know, nowhere near it. Sure. He did finish P 11. So he was close, but he got close, it, but still. It, it, it was still funny. And then you said that Magnuson was going to get his last two penalty points, which nope, but nope. Hulk did. <laughs> uh, I think yeah. next time I'm on and I want to predict anything, I'm just going to switch the teammates. <laughs> just whatever. Just, <laughs> everything backwards. Everything backwards. Yeah. Uh, all right. Final thoughts on uh, the Austrian Grand Prix. Um, I think it was very exciting. I think if the. Uh, energy can stay up if these drivers can stay just a little angry with each other uh, coming into the next race. I think we're going to see a, a very exciting couple weeks coming up. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I want I want angry, but I also want a little bit of like, let's not be too angry because, you know, we had some moments between Lewis and Max in 21 that were like a little right. too angry. See uh, Monza when Max's car landed on top of Lewis's head. So like, I think there's a happy medium between a little bit of aggression and like fighting down that line um, and not, you know, ending up with cars sandwiched on top of each other. Exactly. Uh, but just enough that that aggression um, I want to see more more aggressive drivers like we saw today. I think that really helps the race. Uh, even if sometimes people get knocked out, I think that it helps the sport, and I think that it makes the races a lot more exciting. I fully agree. I, I think that this 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 was a, one of the this was another race that was a very good you know representative for the sport. You know, Canada was another one of those. Um, and I you know there's something to be said for like long tracks versus short tracks, and obviously this is a very short track. Um, but I right. think that short tracks do provide a lot of the best racing that we see in Formula One, with Monaco being a little bit of the outlier <laughs> until they figure out the car size problems and the lack of overtaking. Don't get me started on Monaco. I know we've had, we've had plenty of discussions about our feelings about Monaco. Um, But up next, we are going to one of the most iconic races on the formula one calendar. We are going back to Silverstone. um, And it's, I think it's going to be a really exciting one. Max will be out for blood on the revenge tour um, because he has typically won every race that he has, you know, following the ones that he's lost. Um, And this is of course a home race for Mercedes and McLaren um, and a bunch of drivers on the grid who are British. So it will be, it will be a fun one to watch i'm very much looking forward to it yep our predictions episode will be um, out probably on thursday like normal um we will have another guest host because emily will still be on her way back to the united states um but until then um don't forget to follow us on instagram at going.off.track and if you are watching youtube please hit the subscribe button um and thanks for going off track with us thanks for going off track